Hello and welcome to Red Gaming Tech. I am the kid. Uh, you may remember me from some of the Let's Plays I've got ongoing and from the weekly walkthrough. Uh, this is going to be the start of a new series that we're going to be bringing you here. And this is going to be a few lessons. Sorry, let me just flagging lines where I shouldn't be. Uh, this is going to be kind of an introduction to ultimately how games development is done. Um, but I'm going to start out really with the very, very basics. I just said how games development is done. That is terrible English. Um, so I'm going to start out with the very, very basics. Um, and obviously this is a, pro a series on mostly uh, programming, um, focusing mainly on C++ and C++, C++ and C Sharp. Sorry, I've just worked an eight-hour shift, so I'm a bit knackered. Uh, so I've, <laughs> I've got my little lesson plan here. And I kind of decided I'm going to start right from the very beginning. Um, something to bear in mind, I'm not a trained teacher. Um, I'm going to try and keep this as simple as possible and try and explain everything as fully as possible. I do find when trying to explain these kind of concepts to people who may not have a lot of experience with them, it's best to start from the very, very fundamentals. Um, so most of these lessons I'm going to be doing in um, Visual, uh, Visual C Sharp 2010 Express, which is freely available from Microsoft. There is a professional version, but for our purposes, um, you can go ahead and get Visual C Sharp 2010 Express, or there's, two, there's Visual C Sharp 2008 Express also available. Um, there are some slight differences, nothing too major that's going to affect us in terms of these lessons. So um, if you want to follow along with this, uh, go ahead and download. Visual C Sharp 2010. So today I'm going to be talking about one of the absolute fundamental points of programming um, in any kind of development, um, including games, include, well, in any kind of development, this is one of the, the crucial concepts. Um, and this is going to seem a little bit uninteresting, but you know, as this series progresses, we're going to be using these kind of things constantly. So it's important that, that we understand how integral these two things are. So I've got my little lesson plan in front of me which I wrote up. Um, so the lesson today is going to be on integers and floats, which are floating points. Sorry, I know you're not my glass over. <laughs> uh, integers and floating points. Um, a floating point, well, first thing I've written on my lesson plan is the difference between the two. An integer, let me bring up notepad here. So an integer, an integer is simply a number. So you could have the integer 10. So that is an integer in its rawest form. There are types of integers in terms of development. There is the int 16, the int 32, and the int 64. Now, well, there are others, but these are the kind of the main three. Now, what these mean, if we just stick a space in between the word int and the number, right, that number determines how many bits that integer consists of. So, in terms of how a computer thinks, computers work main primarily in binary, and binary is a base one uh, numbering system. Sorry for the long pause there. Um, so, if I, if we take the way we normally count, then the way we normally count is it is decimal, so it's base ten. So. Uh, say you take the number 100. This is like primary school stuff, I know, but uh, this is going to make sense hopefully pretty soon. Your first column in the number is obviously your units or your ones. The second column is the tens. The third column, well, the third column, we're working left, is hundreds and so on. Then you have thousands, then you have tens of thousands, then you have hundreds of thousands, then you have millions and so on to infinity. Um, obviously, the way this counting system works is it's what's called base 10. So every for every 10, we add a new column. So for every 10 lots of 1, we add a new column. For every 10 lots of 10, we add another column. See where I'm going with this, I presume. So binary being base 1 is that for every 1, you add a new column. So 1 in binary is 1. 2 would be 1, 0, because it's one lot of one lot of 2 and no lots of 1. 3 if you're following along, will be 1, 1, which is one lot of 2 and one lot of 1. This is where it's going to get a little bit confusing, because once you get to 4, it becomes 1, 0, 0, which is one lot of 4, one lot of two, no lots of 2, and no lots of 1. 5, you get 1, 0, 1. Oh, sorry, 1, 0, 0, 1. No, I had it right the first time. It's 1, 0, 1, which is one lot of 4, no 2s, and one lot of 1. 
6 will be 110. 7 will be 111. 8 will be 1000. Okay, I'm going to explain the pattern here for people who haven't picked it up. Basically, your columns in binary become 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, 128, 256, 512, 1024, uh, and so on. Um, so for every every time you add one, I'm trying to think of how to word this because it's quite a, a difficult concept to uh, put into simple terms. But every time you add, you basically the only digits you can have in binary are one and zero. Um, and we're going to come on to how that is extremely relevant in terms of computing in just a minute. So once you understand that concept you know that is quite an important binary is a very important concept to grasp um, I'm sure you've all heard the terms bit byte uh, megabyte kilobyte you know gigabyte so what that actually means is a bit is a binary digit uh, I can't spell today binary digit it's a con the, the term bit is a contraction of the term binary digit a binary digit is either a 1 or a 0 true or false essentially we're going to remember that because we're going to come back to that in a minute a byte is 8 bits and then obviously a kilobyte is 1024 bytes a megabyte is 1024 kilobytes and then you go to a gigabyte which is 1024 megabytes then you have a terabyte which is 1024 gigabytes yes no I'm confusing myself a, gig a gigabyte is a thousand meg is that a terabyte is a thousand gig Jesus Christ my head's spinning already a, <laughs> a terabyte is a thousand and twenty four gigabytes right so Bytes and, well, bits are going to be less relevant in, well, as we move forward. Bytes are going to be important. Megabytes and things like that, yes, they will be important. But it's important to understand what those things mean, and I'm not articulating them terribly well, I know. As I said, I'm not <laughs> a teacher. Um, right, so we've described what integers are, and we've gone into binary. Another key counting system in programming is known as hexadecimal which is the numbers we're used to using go in this order 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 then you add a column you see how we were doing here with the again primary school kind of, kind of level stuff hexadecimal numbers go in this format so hexadecimal is counting in base 16 so for every 16 digits you add another column so, uh, for example, 6 in hexadecimal is 6, or 0, 06, depending on the, fo the formatting that's required. Um, but you can f in hexadecimal, you can have the numbers 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, and 15, and have them all in one column. So, for example, 12 would be C. So, any, and then once you, obviously once you get to 16, 16 would be 1, 0. So you see, for every 16, you're adding a column. So it's one lot of 16, no lots of 1. So for example, 18 in hexadecimal would be 1, 2. It's one lot of 16 and two lots of 1. Um, or say 30 would be... Oh, you're challenging me now. 30 would be 1. So that's 16 plus 14. So it would be 1... Uh, e is 30. Um, again, you can tell it's a hard way to force your brain to think in hexadecimal or binary because your brain is programmed from birth to think in, in decimal. So don't worry if you're struggling with this concept. There's a lot of information on how binary counting in binary works, counting in hexadecimal works. Don't worry if it makes your head spin a little bit because it is quite a tough concept to grasp and me trying to artic articulate it, I'm struggling even then. 
Um, if you have any further questions on hexadecimal or binary, post them in the comments and I'll get back to you on those. Or you, you can post them on our Facebook group even. Uh, just start your comment with at the kid, for example. Um, I know it is quite a tough concept to get your head around, but they are very, very crucial to programming. Um, the next thing I've got on my lesson plan. Ah, I know, I need to tell you what floating points are. I forgot about that. A floating point is, for example, 1.0. This little dot here, the decimal place, makes it a floating point number. So an integer can consist of a number of digits, but it cannot have a decimal place in it. If it has a decimal place in it, it's a floating point number. So you would declare a floating point as float in C sharp, for example. Uh, an integer you would declare as int. So you can there, are, there will be occasions where you have to, certain functions will expect a floating point number instead of an integer because of the way they process the number that it requires that decimal place to be there. So if you want to convert an integer to a floating point number, all you need to do is say you have, your integer is 10, um, then to convert that to a floating point number you do you type 10f in code which will effectively, it's called casting, it will cast that to mean 10.0. So a floating point number can be a series of numbers, point, and then a series of numbers. So for anything that isn't your, where you're not using whole numbers, you need to use a floating point number. Another thing to add is integers can be positive, you can have plus 19, they can be negative, you can have non minus 18. Another concept to remember is what's called an unsigned integer, which is an integer that can be of however, whatever length, but it cannot have a positive or a negative. So an unsigned integer can only be positive. Um, that's really all you need to know about those. I just wrote down, mentioned what an unsigned integer is. So actually, let's actually get into some uh, some coding stuff. So I've written down, talk about integers in various languages. Okay, so my main programming language that I use is, well, my two main ones are C++ and C Sharp. Um, so, as obviously as we're using Visual C Sharp 2010, I'm going to be talk talking to you about C Sharp in this lesson. So, um, I've just started a blank console application called Lesson 1. Um, normally, this bit here, that doesn't come as standard. That's This is code I've written for this lesson. Um, so, if you start a new console application, you'll get everything here minus this. So I'm not going to go into too much detail on the structure of the code here. I'm just going to talk to you literally about integers and floating points because they are a key concept, as I keep saying over and over again. So declaring integers. In C sharp, you declare an integer. Well, actually, that's something that I'm going to come to later. I'm just going to comment that out. To declare an integer in C sharp, don't worry about the errors it's throwing at the bottom. It's because I'm messing with array locations here, and we, I'm going to come to that a little bit later in the lesson. Uh, uh, just, uh, just this is a handy thing to know. In fact, it's a quite a key thing to know. Putting two forward slashes before a line of code, it will turn it into a comment, and comments are not passed by the pass being p a r s e d by the interpreter. They're just ignored. So you can use those to make notes. Um, what I've done here, this is known as commenting out lines of code. So if you want to just remove a line of code quick if it's causing a bug, and you want to see if the program will. Uh, build correctly without that line of code, you can just comment it out and the interpreter will literally just ignore it. As to what the interpreter is, that's something we'll come to later as well. Things like words like compiler, interpreter are all things that will come up as we get more into things. So in C sharp to declare an integer, it's you int, your the int operate well, I was gonna say operator, the int declarator indicates that what you're about to supply is an integer. So you're you're allocating a space in memory, in the computer's memory, and you're telling it that this location in memory will hold an integer. Next, you need to tell it what you want to call that, that location. You have to assign a reference to it. Or is it a dereference? I'm not sure. <laughs> Sorry. But you have to essentially, keeping it simple, you have to give this, var this variable. This is what you're declaring a variable of type integer. You have to give it a name. You can call it whatever you like. You can call it Billy Bob. So this is telling the compiler that at this lo you're, that there is a variable that exists at a location in memory. This is all done for you. You used to have to do this manually years ago. You don't have to do this manually. You can do it manually, but it will do it for you. So you're you're allocating a location in memory that you're telling it will contain an integer. 
you're telling it that you're going to name this integer Billy Bob and you're going to tell it, so you're going to put an equals zero. So you're telling it that this integer, which you've called Billy Bob, is equal to zero. So its value is zero. Right. So what all it's telling me at the moment right now is that I've, ass I've assigned this variable called Billy Bob, telling me you've assigned it, but the value is never used. It's saying, hey, you're declaring a variable here, but you're not, you never do anything with it. So it's basically telling you you're, that line of code is pointless because I'm declaring something and I'm not doing anything with it. So the most basic thing we can do with it is to output it to the console. And the way we do that is we have cons you can either do console.write and then Billy Bob. What that will do is simply write write the value stored in Billy Bob to the console. Or you can it, alternatively you can have console.write line, which will write Billy Bob to the console and then add what's called a brace return character which will put you onto the next line. This console.read line, all, what that co that line of code is actually intended for is it pauses the console, pauses the program and waits for some kind of input from you. Now normally you would put where you're going to store that input in between these brackets but because we don't actually want to do anything all we're saying is wait for wait for me to do something wait for some kind of input and that's just because if I don't have that line if I comment that out what will happen is the program will run it will declare this integer and assign it the value zero it'll output it to the console and then the console will close so you'll get that you'll just get a flash of nothing so you have to do something to actually stop the program and wait for you so you can actually see that output so now if we put in that console.readline command and tell it to wait for some kind of input, if we run it, now we get our console here and we've got the zero. So the zero is the value in Billy Bob, as we can see there. The next thing, well actually I'm going to, no, I'll stay in C sharp for now. To declare a floating, a floating point number, it's float and we can call it Johnson for some reason. <laughs> and we can say that equals 0.894. For example, and then we can have it output that. Oh, sorry, uh, I forgot. When you enter a floating point number, you have to put that f after it. And now again, it's saying the variable Johnson is assigned, but its value is never used. It's saying you've declared this variable, but you're not doing anything with it. You're wasting your time. That was actually a lapse in my memory because I had forgotten that you ha you always have to put that in C sharp at least you always need to put the F after a floating point variable. Sorry about that, I forgot to tell you that. That is just a quirk of C, C, uh, C sharp. Okay so next we're gonna because it's saying you, oh you're not doing anything with that we can do something with it so we can do console.write line Johnson. You have to spell it right of course. So now if we run the program, it's going to output Billy Bob, 0, and it's going to output the value stored in Johnson, which is 0 0.894. This leads me in to the next part, which is operations you can perform, mathematical operations you can perform on integers and floating point numbers within a, pro within a program. So, for example, we've got these two variables. For, the e for simplicity, I'm just going to convert Johnson to an int. You'll notice that if I try and declare an integer and call it Johnson, oh, uh, okay, that didn't mean to do that. Um, it's going to start complaining. If I declare an integer called Johnson, but its value is a floating point, it's going to tell you, you cannot implicitly convert type float to int. An explicit conversion exists. Are you missing a cast? What it's telling you is that it's expecting an integer, but you're giving it a floating point. The most languages. Uh, there are some exceptions, but most languages won't allow you to have a decimal float or floating point number in an integer uh, location. Um, as for the ins and outs of exactly why that is, it's because an integer cannot handle the decimal pl the decimal place character. A an integer can only consist of the numbers zero to nine. The actual way that a floating point number is stored in memory is fundamentally different to an integer, although they seem similar to us in terms of how a computer works they are notably different um, but I'm not going to go too far into that because again we're getting a bit ahead of ourselves so if it, for just ease of ease of whatever ease I'm just going to convert 
Johnson to an integer and I'm going to give Billy Bob a value that's not zero. So we now have two integers. So there are a number of operations you can perform on integers and floating points. So for example, we can add Johnson to Billy Bob. So what we can do is we can say there exists a new integer. Its name is the kid and its value is equal to Billy Bob plus Johnson. Oh, always remember your semicolons. Oh, I should probably do that before I start outputting stuff. Let's just put it up here. So now our block of code has contains three variables. We've got Billy Bob, which equals seven, Johnson, which equals four, and the kid wh whose value is Billy Bob plus Johnson. So now if we add another console dot right line I forgot the dot dot right line oh right line and we put the kid and add our semicolon then run our program. What it's going to output is the value stored in Billy Bob, which is seven, the value stored in Johnson, which is four, and the value stored in kid, which because we are before we're writing this line, we're saying that the kid is equal to Billy Bob plus Johnson. The value stored in the kid by the time it writes this line is 11, which is 7 plus 4. This might seem like obvious stuff, but I want to start from the absolute basics so that, you know, it's just easier for people who aren't familiar with with these sorts of, you know, the ins and outs of how programming works and what's involved. Other things we can do is we can say the kid is equal to a Billy Bob minus Johnson. If we run that, it's going to tell us what the value in Billy Bob is, what Johnson is. It's going to tell us that the kid is now equal to 3, which is 7 minus 4 equals 3. We can do... Now, doing, dividing here is going to cause t a slight technical issue. It will do it, but it, something will go wrong and you'll notice it. It's going to say that 7 divided by 4 is 1. Of course it's not, but because the kid is an integer, it cannot handle the decimal places that go in that are part of the result because an integer cannot handle decimal places so what's happening is they're being discarded and it's just output outputting it to the it's rounding essentially it's giving us just the number before the decimal place if i turn the kid into a float and then run the program that wasn't meant to happen <laughs> Um, it's gonna be, is it? Sorry about that. Um, I just uh, had a brain fart. Um, so the reason it's returning one is be well was because I've now corrected it was because Billy Bob and Johnson were both integers and an inter integer divided by an integer will always result in an integer even if you're putting it into a floating point data type. So if we make Billy Bob and Johnson floats as well as the kid and then run the program. We now get the output, the actual result of 7 divided by 4, which is 1.75. Moving on, the other obvious one that is missing is multiplied, or the multiplication operator. So we're now saying that the value in the kid equals Billy Bob times Johnson, multiplied by Johnson. And that gives us the result 28. So 7 times 4 is 28. Again, primary school stuff. Those are going to be the core operators you can use on integers. Those are the four main operations you can perform on integers and floating point numbers. Um, next thing on my list is actually casting integers to floating points. Um, what you saw me attempt earlier was typecasting. Now, for some reason, it's there's, there seems to be an issue, because I haven't used typecasting in a long time, it's not really the best thing to do, but it's a thing you can do, which is you can... I'm just going to try it here. Float. So uh, the, <laughs> the next part in my lesson plan says casting integers to floating points, which I've just shown you, um, which being that you need, uh, basically it's indicating that you have to have that F there. Uh, we've talked about unsigned integers. Um, I've got integers in various languages. I suppose I can show you this. Um, 
So depending on the language you're using, you declare variables differently. And this is something I want to bring in early on because the syntax of every language is different. So, for example, uh, in C sharp, to declare an integer, it's int a equals and then it, whatever value it has. Oh, no, I made a mistake there. Remember your semicolons. Uh, other languages are basic, like you would code on a ZX Spectrum back in the day. You would It would be let a equals 1. Um, in uh, 8085 machine code, it would be MVI uh, with the name of the... Re this is this. Don't worry too much about machine code. Machine code is the lo almost the lowest level form of code you can have. And what it is, it's, it's addressing the CPU directly and performing extremely low level operations on the CPU. But how you would place an integer into the, one of the CPU's registers would be MVI B, the re register B, and then you would say which what number you want to put into that register. Don't worry too much about machine code. If you do fancy having a play with it, I just installed a program about 10 minutes before I started this tutorial, which claims to emulate um, a an 8085 uh, microprocessor, which you would need to code in machine code. So if I try and plop some values in here, MVI B1, um, MOV A B, MVI C uh, 1. Now it's been a while since I've used machine code. Add C ST, no, it's STR, STV. Uh, let me check my little cheat sheet because I haven't used machine code in a while. It is. STA, that's the one store. STA at memory location 8200. And then to print that. Oh no, we can't print it. We're using machine code. Well, you can, but it's not that simple. So all that's happening here is I'm directly. This is a virtual process. I'm not actually addressing the processor in my machine. What I'm doing here. Again, don't worry about this too much. The odds of you, odds are you will ne never, seldom, if never, if not never, have to deal with machine code. But it's worth looking into and learning some basics of it. I'm putting the number one into the register B of the of the 8085 processor. I'm then moving the value in B to A. Now, uh, register A on an 8085 processor is what's called the accumulator, so it's used for addition. I'm then into register C. I'm placing another one. And then I'm adding C to what the add command will add C to whatever's in the accumulator. So the result obviously will be two, and I'm storing that value at memory location 8200. Now I've never used this program before, so let's see what happens. Assembler assemble. We're going to call it test. Program assembled successfully, and now we're going to try and execute it. Now, nothing seemed to happen. Now, can we assembler execute? Did something happen? Reset. Uh, da, 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 da. Oh, God, I should, really should have practiced with this program before I did this. Ah, here are all of our memory addresses. So if I try and find address 8200, I should find a 2 there somewhere. There it is. There's our two in memory address 8200. <laughs> I really don't worry too much about this. Um, I just wanted to give you an example of different languages. Machine code is not something you need to worry about too much. Um, but what's actually happening here, as I just said, it's, ad literally, it's adding two numbers together and then placing them in memory, memory location 8200. Uh, this is something we'll come back to later, so I wanted to introduce that concept early. Uh, right, is there anything else I can tell you about integers and floats? Well, the reason I've started with them is because they are one of the core things you will need to, to be successful in any way in programming. Pretty much everything does come down to numbers, and integers and floats are the two main types of numbers you'll be dealing with in pretty much any programming language. 
the other application of integers or really just numbers and binary in itself is a concept known as boolean which you may have heard of a boolean operator or a boolean value is a value that can have is a, a data type that can have two values it can either be one or it can be not two <laughs> it can either be one or zero one indicates true so a boolean is a true or false so a one is true zero is false uh, or one is on zero is off now what boolean operators are used for is for things like um, this is an if statement we're going to come on to this pretty soon because again it's another very early thing we should look at we can say if Johnson um, equal, double equals so it's one equals this, this is another kind of thing that again we're going to touch on later I'm still just doing the very basics if you're checking whether something is equal to something or not you put equals a double equals if you want to say if it's not equal to it it's exclamation mark equals the exclamation mark is always the not operator so you're saying if Johnson is not equal to the value that's coming next so 18 then do this so we could have console dot write line hello bitches uh, bo hello botches bo botches so now because Johnson is not equal to 18 as I stated we'll get hello botches 7428 now we can say if Johnson is equal to 18 do that of course Johnson is not equal to 18 so we don't get our hello botches so, um, if we say if Johnson is equal to 4 then do this we get our hello botches again because Johnson is indeed equal to 4 so the equals equals will always return a boolean value true or false and an if statement will always it will always expect a boolean value a true or a false now what you can do is you can actually have a boolean data type which you declare as bool and we're going to call that balls um, so you can perform an oh yeah it's telling me that it's used, declared but never used it will always tell you that because it's trying to save you wasting your time so with this boolean value the value of a bool will always be true or false so what we can do is say if Johnson equals equals four, balls are boolean uh, variable equals false, and then we can add an, another if statement that says if balls equals equals false, then console dot right line. <clears throat> there we go. Oh wait, I should probably put that in quotes. Um, and don't forget your semicolon. So now, if we initialize balls to be true, <laughs> I never thought I'd find myself saying that in a programming tutorial. Uh, so when we start the program, we're saying that there exists a boolean variable named balls, and it's true. So we're now saying if Johnson equals four, well actually no, let's say if Johnson equals something which it doesn't, like nine, then balls is false. If balls is false, then write this line. So if we execute the program, it won't write it because Johnson is not equal to nine, therefore balls does not equal false. If we make this statement true, that Johnson is, e is equal to four, then balls becomes false. And if balls is equal to false, write that line. So in, as a result, we get that line output. So that's really just a brief look at how Boolean values work and how Boolean operators work. Um, other Boolean operators you can have, uh, so you've got the standard is equal to, you can have is not equal to, you can have is greater than or, or equal to, you can have is less than or equal to. Um, there are other less common ones, which I don't need to go into yet, um, but I think, 
we can pretty much stop there for integers and floats. So I know this has been a little bit disjointed and things. As I say, I'm not a professional teacher. Um, so what I'm going to say is any questions you have on any of this, feel free to post it in the comments section. I'll be scanning through it and answering any questions you have. Um, if you or you can also post we do have a facebook group at red gaming tech just search red gaming tech on facebook send us a message or post a comment asking your question and then i'll be sure to answer it as soon as possible so hopefully this has been a reasonably useful introduction into the world of integers and floating point uh variables i'm not sure whether i actually did, ever gave an explanation of what these numbers mean after integers after int now i'm saying it because you'll notice if i declare an integer, I can actually say int 16 uh, tit equals 1. So it's saying you're, you're declaring this, but you're, never, you're assigning it, but you're never using it. What an int 16 means is that it's an integer that consists of 16 bits, which means that it can only hold a number that is up to 16 bits long. So 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. 13, 14, 15, 16. So the, the, that integer must fit in binary into this many bits. Now what that means is that there is a maximum value that that integer memory location can hold. I'm going to need a calculator to tell me what that is. So my actual, you'd be surprised at me being a programmer that my math really isn't that good. And the value of that will be 1 plus 2 plus 4 plus 4 uh, uh, clear that CE 1 plus 2 plus 4 oh uh, there's got to be a quick sorry about that <laughs> that calculator was not playing ball with me for some reason uh, right so I've actually had to just google it because it was going to save me time rather than actually faffing around and doing the cal doing it with the calculator the value that can fit into an int 16 is the range between minus 32,768 and positive 32,768, um, which gives you a range of... Da, 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 times 2 equals... So your range that you can fit into a 16-bit integer is 65,548. Any number larger than that in its binary form will not fit into in, in int 16 or in a 16-bit integer. So if you're going to need to work with a number larger than that, if you, well, if you want to work with numbers smaller than that, it's actually more efficient to use an int 16 since it uses up less memory. Then if you need a number, to work with a number bigger than that, you would then move up to an int 32, which is which you can fit a massive number in an int 32. I, cannot, <laughs> I can't figure that out in my head. Uh, mind you, I couldn't even figure out what goes in an int 16 in my head, so um, never mind. If you need to work with an even bigger number, then you need to use an int 64, which is an integer that consists of 64 bits. So this 64 times, you know, 64 zeros. If your number is bigger than that, uh, there aren't a lot of numbers that are bigger than that. This, this would be an astronomical number. Uh, it, it's a number that theoretically exists, but it's unlikely you will ever need a number that high. Uh, in day-to-day -day programming. Uh, so an int, int 64 is really the the biggest you will ever need and even then you're working with astronomical numbers. Um, right, so I think I'm probably bored everyone to death and burnt a few brains, including my own. So I'm going to call it a lesson there. So this has been an introduction to the concept of integers and floating point numbers. Some of the things you can do with them, things like um, operations you can perform on them and how binary works, how hex what hexadecimal is, uh, even some very basic if statements and looking into Boolean values and Boolean operators. Um, so I think I've gotten a lot out. How, can, how coherent it was is down to you to report back if you've got any ideas for improvement in how I'm teaching this post a comment or post on the Facebook and I'll be sure to get back to you. Uh, I've been The Kid here at Red Gaming Tech. Thanks for watching and I will see you soon for lesson two. Hopefully no technical, technical difficulties next time. Thank you and goodbye.